Trigger, Trigger on. on. Welcome, dear all, to the Duck Face Diaries. We are a World Trigger Retro podcast aiming to discuss the World Trigger manga volume by volume. I'm Wesley Cheddar. And I'm Hoven with an H, and this month we're going through volume 18, which covers chapters 152 to 160, and is also adapted across season 2, episodes 10 to 12, and the start of season 3, episode 1. Uh, by which I mean, like, a fraction of a chapter's worth is in season three. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't really consider um, making it very convenient for you to say at the start of our pod. No, they really didn't. They should have had that consideration, to be honest. Yeah, quite rude of them. Well, uh, let's not beat around the bush. Today we are joined by a very special guest, uh, quite a mysterious one, in fact. She is, according to her Twitter profile, half girl, half cat, half host of the Dumb Weeps pod, half host of the Demon Slayer pod, I believe. Uh, we are happy to welcome Alison, aka Meowth900. How are you doing, fam? Uh, glad to have you on the show. Woo! Collaborating between time zones is tough, but I made it. What have you been up to lately? Surviving the academic grind. Right, I get that. I'm happy to have that behind me. Well, I have been lately, uh, along with Milo, watching The Office. I was quite surprised to see very similar dynamics to those in World Trigger. Uh, I was quite surprised that they have their own Scruffy Hottie, they have their own Konami, by which I mean really Dwight and Jim have basically the, uh, the same dynamic. <laughs> Meanwhile, now that I have completed the entire Mashima long-running bibliography, I've now moved on to Togashi Heaven, and I'm going, making my way through Yu Yu Hakusho, which is very good fun. It looks really great. It has that cool 90s aesthetic, and it also holds up very well from an animation point of view, so that's been fun. We started the first episode with, with Asha lately, and I was surprised to see a good old mid-Atlantic attempt of like a fave British accent in Botan. <laughs> yes, she's got a very distinctive dub accent for sure. I knew nothing about that series, so I'm, I'm going in blind. It's not particularly revolutionary or unique premise-wise, but it's just a, it's a comfy watch, and definitely picks up more when it transitions into being a like a full-on battle series, I think. Today we are going to start with a bit of an interview with you, Alison, to get basically your thoughts about World Trigger, about how you first read the manga, how your journey started. Then after that, we're going to do a bit of a volume summary of volume 18, created, of course, by Daisuke Ashihara, translated by Toshikazu Aizawa, touch-up and lettering done by the great Ace Core Chrisman, designed done by Julian J.R. Robertson, and edited by Ray First. After that, we are going to move on to our general thoughts, do a bit of an Ashihara comment corner, quite a few notes, in fact, in mm, that one. Yeah, same. Bit of a spoiler corner, along with any spoilery favourite moments if you have any parts of this volume, Alison. But, and then do a bit of a Q&A section which I forgot to do a QA and a post for, <laughs> uh, but we got one extensive comment which is basically the answer to your call about uh, World Trigger movie pitches. Hey, we don't, we don't have to just read questions, we can read comments as well. So yeah, uh, shall we get into the interview? I was just thinking we, we usually have a comments corner, so, so what would the comments <coughs> corner be? Ah. Oh. There we go, there we go, uh, go with the doggo. Yeah, we got a million dog, what's it called, thingy dog, Rillenthal? Yeah, Rillenthal, yeah. <laughs> there, we made the joke, finally. <laughs> <laughs> the best guest appearance. Um, yeah, um, good to start with the interview? Yeah, let's do it. So, Alison. How did your World Trigger journey start? Well, I think I saw the anime floating around via like different gaming websites, and a YouTuber I follow like mentioned the name and thought it was pretty good. That was how I first heard of it. And then I saw the manga existed and actually had English publishing, because usually that's pretty rare for something so exotic in art style. And it was like really long, so I didn't want to like invest money into it because volumes are expensive. Yeah, eventually they put it on the Shonen Jump application, so I just kind of read it in there. It's a little bit easier to catch up to since they moved it to Square, because now it's monthly instead of weekly. It's definitely much easier not to fall behind too much. <laughs> yeah, especially with the, the hiatus it had. Although, even at the time, I believe Ashihara did have quite some breaks before the hiatus itself because of his health condition. But interestingly, I don't think we've had anyone who started with the anime yet. And I kind of like the art style and how the mango characters were like really, really different from every other type of shonen main character, if that makes any sense at all. 
It's also like a lot of world building and stuff, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So, what are some of your favorite characters in World Trigger? Well, I like the Gabby Bear of guy that the little boy rides on. Raijin Maru. That one's the best one. Gotta love a derpy pet. I do love that. It's like my stepbrother whose favorite character from One Piece is Karu, <laughs> Vivi's duck. <laughs> Human-wise, I guess favorite one would be the fluffy guy who makes the three face. Yuma. Yeah, that one. What are some of your favorite moments in the series up until this volume? I usually like those moments where it gets intense and characters get hurt in those fights. I really like those moments. <laughs> the real clutch moments where everything is happening all at once. Yes, that's my jam, man. You say you had your own trigger and you could personalize it with your own trigger activation pose and catchphrase, what would they be? That's right, I'm here to fight, and I do the cat claws. <laughs> I was gonna say, would you literally do a meow, that's right? Yes, but here to fight at, at the end so I can avoid show pro copyright infringement. They do tend to yeah. do that, yes. Like, do the motion of the cat claws and then little mini scorpions come out of your hands. Exactly. Oh. And the last question, if the people of Tamakoma were a Super Sentai tokusatsu team, who would be the ranger, and which colour would they have, and what would be their theme? Well, I think the main guy with glasses, he would probably be a blue guy, cool and collected. Yuma, I think he would probably be a yellow, because he's quirky, but not leadery quirky, if that makes any sense. Which would we give Jin? He would be like the red ranger, because he's kind of like the leader, but like not too hyperactive. He could be like the Gokai Red or the Shinken Red of the Tokuzatsu stuff. I would think that he would be like the Sixth Ranger since he operates in the shadows and often on the periphery of the main characters. I guess Composed Beefcake would be more of a conventional Red Ranger type. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the one that looks like the frog. Frog? Oh, Chica. She would be a green, I think. Yeah, we gotta have a pink one somewhere, but I'm not sure who would be the pink. Uh, maybe Konami? Yeah. That was a record time interview, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to the summary. The match begins with Ikoma Squad placed relatively close together. Oki grasshoppers to a high rooftop and is immediately spotted by OG Squad attacker Yutaka Kashio. OG Squad uses the knowledge they have to try and deduce Osamu's location, while Yuma tries to draw OG to Chika's sniping location. However, the captain doesn't fall for it, splitting up with Kashio to look elsewhere. Soon Osamu's incomplete wire zone is found by both squads, and they send out Kai and Kashio respectively to investigate. However, Osamu turns the situation around by luring them into each other before hiding. After much consideration, Osamu decides to go west, a decision that is anticipated by Oji. Kurachi goes in to back up Kashio, the two of them dispatching Kai pretty swiftly, much to Maori and Ikoma's chagrin. The goggle-wearing captain bemoans, Our selling point is that we're a four-man squad. If we lose a dude, we got nothing but Oki's popularity with girls. Just then, Tamakoma engages, with Yuma swooping in. Together, he and Chika lose Kashio and Kurauchi an arm and a leg respectively, before the neighbor blocks the squad's path. But then, from further down the road, Ikoma lets out his signature whirlwind. Yuma barely blocks any critical damage for all parties with his scorpion, but receives a leaking wound in his side. After being reminded by his squad's shooter, Satoshi Mizukami, that he can just use Ikoma Whirlwind more than once, Ikoma does just that. The commentators give an exploration of how his exceedingly long reach works, as shortening his activation time maximizes the firing range of his Kogetsu. Oji Squad tries to pin Yuma as he's stuck in the middle, but Mizukami puts the pressure on them with a hound, posing as an asteroid, forcing them to take evasive maneuvers. This fight's getting intense, man. Someone just kicked a picture frame. So you should definitely rename the grasshoppers the picture frames. <laughs> I was like, are they inside a house, like, destroying the property? <laughs> <sighs> After Kurauchi becomes the focus of Tamakoma's attacks, Yuma uses the fray to behead him, taking him out. While arguing over who would look worse from cutting down a cute small lass like Chika, Ikoma and Kai give chase to Yuma, eventually resulting in a duel with him. 
Meanwhile, following their retreat, OG squad starts going after enemy snipers. With OG and Cassio pursuing them, Osamu and Chika move to try and regroup with Yuma in the wire zone. We see through a flashback that OG's counter to Chika's lead bullets is to keep fire on her so that she's unable to fire back. Cassio seems to be enacting this tactic to much effectiveness, but is soon caught out by a clever bluff. Chica does a small hop as though there were a wire in the road. Woo! The fucking hop! Yes, the fucking hop. It, but it is in fact a ruse. Osamu enters and through a complex series of maneuvers with Chica, finally manages to take down his first opponent. However, Oji himself soon descends upon the scene in a very princely manner to face Osamu himself. With newfound confidence after this takedown, Osamu is certain that he can take on Oji's offhand while Oji's main efforts are focused on Chika. However, he is quickly outmatched going down with a scorpion through the neck. Seeing this, Chika uses Hound to destroy the ground beneath them and make a smoke scream so that she is able to escape Oji and reach the wire zone. From here, her and Yuma have the advantage with both enemy squads advancing inwards. Ikoma squad in particular have little choice as they've yet to score a point. Chika continues to fire on the field, moving each time she does to avoid Oki. In clashing with Yuma along with Mizukami, Ikoma notes that he's gotten even faster since his earlier fight logs possibly as a result of the wire zone. Yuma bounces some debris at Mizukami with Grasshopper. With Grasshopper? What's that? Sorry, with a picture frame. That's right. Uh, leaving him wide open for a lead bullet and subsequent takedown from Oji. Oji goes in to face Yuma, as beating him would prevent his squad from losing. However, Ikoma takes advantage of a break in sniping from Chika to cut down a bunch of the houses with his whirlwind. In one of my favourite manoeuvres in the series, uh, Yuma takes advantage of the chaos to send some wire attached debris flying with a particularly well placed picture frame, tripping Oji up and allowing for a swift takedown with two very medieval sword shaped scorpions, a takedown fitting for a prince. Uh, Wednesday Dale? First of all, uh, our boy's lying. OG bails out, but sends a parting gift. So an asteroid barrage that turns Yuma's leg into Swiss cheese. So, so cubes, no good. Uh, I can confirm. Then she could defend herself against Oki sniping, and of course popularity with girls. They shoot at the same time, so the shrimp frog loses a leg in her escape, but manages to plant a lead bullet in the opposing sniper's chest. So this is Yuma's moment. He feigns a coma, uh, only to launch himself with grasshopper and cut into Oki's trine supply. Ikoma, however, reaches the neighbor with his insanely long Kagetsu whirlwind, predicting uh, him being launched in the air with a picture frame. As Chika bails out on her own, the match ends. Only then does Ikoma realize that despite being the hot guy and, you know, surviving the round, he did not win the match. He even asks if, do I get three points for the last kill or something? But no, no, uh, he doesn't actually. So Osamu's team got four points, while the other two teams got three. The team then exchanges the usual high fives, while the commentary team rounds down for the night. So the Pompadour boy Toma highlights the fact that Oji was smart to go after Toma Koma first, and any clever squad will do the same in the future because of the wire strategy making Yuma stronger. The more Osamu remains on the field, the worse it is for the other squads. And the fact that only Yuma can rescue the others makes the team vulnerable so someone else who'd be strong enough could even the scales and cover that weakness. Well, I, I wonder who that could be. Mm. Uh, I guess we'll never know. On an unrelated note, our newest member of Border, who is also a neighbor, Hughes, is breaking the record for the C-rank Banda elimination in 1.5 seconds and collects 3,000 points in his Kogetsu for destroying all the trainees in a series of Battle Royale skill test matches at the induction ceremony. Uh, just like with Yuma, Tokieda shows Hughes to the solo rank wars room, and just like with Yuma, he blows away the three C-rank idiots in three consecutive panels while looking extremely bored. And just like that, Hughes becomes B-Rank, so some B-Rank attackers take notice of him and decide to duel him, just a sword without betting any points. So Hughes accepts the proposal, getting five kills against Kawarai, Tamoe, and Mura. Sasamori gets to steal one win from the neighbor despite losing five times, and then Suji gets two, a surprising low from the former A-Rank. But then the schmucks decide to egg on the six-rank uh, attacker Ikoma, we uh, just saw in the match to take up the challenge. Suji predicts the stone-faced Digimon protagonist will lose since he can't use Whirlwind, 
but he manages to score a point against Hughes in the first round. So they manage to tie 4-4, but hilariously, Ikoma loses by default since he uses Whirlwind out of habit. So then Tachikawa, the first rank attacker and first rank overall solo agent of all people, comes over to win 5-1, prompting Hughes to think it's going to be a while before he manages to go against the top Medan agents especially if they're fully geared. He praises the VR training system in his thoughts and the fact that agents can actually train without beating each other to a bloody pulp, only sustaining, I guess, psychological damage through, through repeated dismemberment. When Karai sneaks in a cheeky invitation for the newly minted B-rank to join his squad, Hughes says he's already got one. Back at Tamakoma base, Konami does a double take when it turns out the neighbor has already been promoted. Hughes says he has things to consider about his trigger set, while Isami urges him to try on his new Tamakoma 2 uniform. An official member of the squad from the next match onwards, Hughes is welcomed by his new captain, but he brushes off Osama's greeting, saying that he's willing to cooperate, but he will not follow orders that he doesn't seem valid. So uh, Osama agrees for now, as long as the Apto ally helps them on the expedition. And we close the volume foreshadowing the introduction of two senior members of Tamakoma, uh, who were coming back from a scouting trip. You Yuri Rinto and Michael Cronin. Dum 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 dum. This wasn't actually that much of a cliffhanger, I guess. Yeah, general thoughts? So, um, this is a rarity for us. We get all of a, a fight, basically, contained within one recap. That, that doesn't usually happen. It's usually split across the middle. Uh, and it's a pretty good fun one. There's a lot of very cool little maneuvers in here. Uh, particularly, I think, the ones that stand out to me are like Osamu's tag team with Chika on the roof, take out Kashio, uh, and Yuma's takedown of Oji at the end. Ikoma provides excellent comic relief throughout the whole fight, and I think the fight is more interested in drawing a parallel between Osamu and Oji than anyone else. Like, Oji is basically a manifestation of the kind of threats that Ninomiya warns Osamu about. That someone who is tactical, just like him, but also far more capable to act on those tactics himself. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I was just going to say, no spoilers, but it's not the last time that Osamu gets compared to Oji, uh, in a certain sense. There's also debatably a bit of a parallel with Ikoma Squad as well, with two of them not wanting to shoot Chika. <laughs> she doesn't want to shoot them either, but I guess it, that one's more played for, like, levity. Yeah, remember the, the very first time I read World Trigger, this rank war was very good. It was the point where many characters started to blend together for me, because like, I didn't have the benefit of reading this or watching this several times. I Ikoma and Oji themselves are funny characters, but the squads are not built up that much of an interesting way, and there's like a lot of them. Because obviously with Ikoma, you do have that very larger-than-life captain character, so that at least sticks in your mind, but Oji's squad, I did always kind of forget about them until subsequent rewatches. Yeah, this is only like the second time I read this, so I forgot a lot of people's names. I totally get that. I would never fault someone for forgetting characters' names in the World Trigger. There are so many characters, God. I was to draw a parallel to a previous match with a lot of characters. There was one with Asuma, Kage, and Ninomiya squads, but each of those had their own roles, a lot of those agents, uh, even though there were a lot of them. Here, individual agents are like less well-defined, still serviceable, and they still have their functions in the most recent arcs. I, I guess it's more of a sausage fest this time. I don't know. What do you think about this volume, Alison? I thought this volume had a lot of nice action choreography. Everyone's flying around and doing cool attacks. Very action-packed. I think my standout panel of the volume is the way the bagworm spins as Kuga does his takedown, his beheading of Karauchi. Looks very cool. If you ever wanted like a sample pack of whatever World Trigger has to offer, I think this would be like a good... Good vertical slice. Yeah. A lot of slicing and dice. I think Nova once said on a previous recap that like this is one of the favorite matches, but because it's just really fun, creative stuff like uh, Yuma launching the debris with a fucking picture frame. I love that. Then, then using another piece of debris to tie OG together. Yeah, it's quite fun. OG in this match is me in a bunch of D and D scenarios. It's like I always plan ahead a bunch of potential strategies, and then when I'm actually thrown into encounters, it all completely falls apart. <laughs> yeah, it all depends on all those dice rolls. 
roll as you get. Or just the GM not doing what I thought they would do with the enemies. <laughs> the moment of OG chasing down Osama and Chika was very tense. When I read this for the recap, I thought that this was very well executed. I, I did really like OG's role as a lone wolf assassin in the latter half of the map. I wonder if this match maybe was originally supposed to have Hiroshima in it, but then they realised that Osama needs more points to, to actually advance the plot. In terms of the tension, that's definitely carried across very well in the anime. Well, I think the thing that this fight really nails there is the moments of desperation. When a character is rendered sort of confused and disoriented, they always move around in a very flailing, desperate way. The camera is always positioned in ways that emphasize how disoriented they are. That's true, but uh, of course we can't forget like the most important moment of this volume, which is Chica's little hop. Come on. Yes. We can't admit that. Now, it's a really fun creative thing to make Casio think there is a wire zone there, while there isn't, and especially nice focus on Chica, who often doesn't get a lot of agency, and this is one thing that maybe is crucial for her development, but... She's starting to really get good at coming up with little tactics on the fly, which is something she wasn't as active in before. And it's a nice focus on how she's crucial for the spider strats, since otherwise they can just turn down the wires with Meteor. Why? Oki covering Chica was so important from Ikoma Squad's side. And apart from the hop, a tactical moment that I really liked was Yuma solving the problem of Iko and Mizukami outranging him by catapulting debris. Yeah, mm. that was re really fun. One thing that I had a thought on is showcasing Hughes at the entrance exam feels very in line with Shihara's desire to show every stage of the process. I feel like the natural flow in another manga would have probably had that cliffhanger of, but we need someone else for the team. And and then go immediately to where he is after he's passed. And you have all these people saying rumours of like, oh, did you hear? He got through the test so quickly. And then the B-rankers start challenging him. But the fact that it kind of included all of that as well, it's definitely Ashihara's distinctive pace for things. Yeah, I, I could see that as even kind of a weakness. Honestly, he could have it without the sequence. But also it was quite funny him repeating the process that, that, that Yuma exactly had, uh, especially yeah. with him beating the, the three idiots. And the panelling is quite fun. My last thought on the volume is Hughes' comments on Border's weapons and the standards of soldiers reinforces how he and Kuga, they're very ingenious with how they use their triggers and why they can use them so creatively. Border is a much younger in the field of using Trion weapons, but they're much more multifaceted with it. Whereas Afto in the neighbourhood, they have a much longer standing Trion based military culture. You even get this with the fact that Hughes was trained by Visa, someone who is older than any of Border's combatants by many decades. So it's like how basically Yuma and Hughes are able to combine the strengths of experienced neighbour worlds and Border. Yeah, especially since we noted during the invasion how the triggers are also kind of multi-purpose, but also limited through this is the one thing that you have and you can use it in many different ways. Like Lamberus is a great example of how versatile after triggers can be. We'll go through this in the next uh, border briefing file, I suppose. In kind of D&D &D terms, border is like having a D&D &D spellcaster where you constantly have to switch between prepared spells every long rest. I really like that we, as you mentioned, stopped the tournament for a bit to basically make uh, room for Hughes' induction. It's a new perspective in the look of border from the after warriors point of view i felt it was kind of a breath of fresh air as i read for the recap rhyming with osamu and yuma's introduction it's a good new way to break up the sports series pace in general mm. then i guess that there's my random observations which are i found it interesting how og and minami kawa's dialogue balloons were mostly circular while everyone else's are hexagonal i guess it's to highlight the bright and breezy nature as, as opposed to everyone else being more so and serious. Osama's wire strategy is something that made a strong impression at the start but is more easily countered and wanes in importance afterwards. It's definitely a tool to show his ingenuity with him baiting Cassio and Kai to take each other out, rather than it being an end in itself at this match. He's still giving them busy work in having them be something they need to deal with in the first place. It's, you know, since we keep coming back to D&D, &D, action economy is key. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is. I just found it amusing how like it uh, faded into the background so quickly. Mm. It was supposed to be like, a background support thing. It's a big contrast after the last match. I forgot that Kurochi, who I considered the rando of all randos, he was using a composite bullet. Yeah, it retains Hound's homing capabilities. It's with Meteor. 
So, OG's nicknames. <laughs> I feel like we've talked about those. There are two new ones from describing the members of Katori Squad. One is Muller, and I don't know which one it's referring to, if it's referring to Mura or Wakamura. And the other one is Jackson, and I don't know who that's referring to either. Like, which one does it fit? I... What? How many nicknames is he up to now? He nicknames, I think, every character, but most of those are least based on the... Mm proper names of the characters. Yeah. In trying to listen to his, how he pronounces them in the anime, it was quite hard for me to get a phonetic difference on some of them. Like, I couldn't really see how he pronounced Osamu and Kuga differently, but maybe that's just because my ears aren't used to detecting different kind of pronunciations with, like, a Japanese accent. I don't know. Actually, I didn't pay attention because I was focusing on something else while watching the anime. I wonder if he like, pronounces Osamu with, with a brief pause before S. I think mm. that, that's how Romaji usually transcribes it. I don't know. Both Mizukami and Ikoma are translated as having some kind of a regional accent. As I checked the wiki, all members of Ikoma squad, uh, except Minamisawa, speak in the Kansai dialect. I suppose Toshikazu Aizawa aimed to translate that as Southern, I guess? That's usually how it's done. That's quite a common way to do Kansai in particular, but sometimes it just becomes every region like with, a, with like a regional accent. <laughs> if this were like a British localization, what would it be? I think it would be Cockney. Cockney is the regional accent that everyone outside of the UK knows. I know, but if it were like more logical, but because Cockney could be compared to New York accents, so like Joe Wheeler could be Cockney. Mm, I guess because I've been playing through Dragon Quest XI lately. Oh my god, I love that game. It's really good. Uh, very, very comfy and lovely to look at. But the way they designate between city folk and designated country accent, they have kind of a a West Country sort of vibe for the country accent. And then the city is either RP for the soldiers and the royalty, and then Cockney for the poorer residents. Eric is my boy. Eric, he is... Uh, he's not the brightest, but he's very pretty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, West Country makes sense. I love how Mizukami has to actively remind Ikoma he can just try to get the whirlwind again. After it fails to hit him, he's like, you know he can just do it again, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah. This fight, it's something that I didn't realize at the start, but it does showcase his intellect and the choice of him being the shooter. That's also quite interesting. Perhaps his fighting style is motivated in a similar way to Osamu's, the mid-range position being the best of the battle. Also, he uses Hound, but pretends it's Asteroid, and also uses Meteor, and pretends it's Asteroid as well. I suppose certain members of certain squads may have caught a glimpse of them. Also, there's a couple of interesting panels lettering-wise. There is like slash, but diagonally, but sort of written from left to right when Ikoma cards Karouchi, but then there's BAM, but from the other way around, right to left, so when Oki snipes. And this Ikoma suddenly being all for game regarding Yuma kill stealing was quite funny. Him being all confident about Yuma's close combat skills and then withdrawing after being overwhelmed. This was quite a fun comic relief moment. A lot of my notes are basically Ikoma does a funny and I liked it. Oh, I'm glad you're honest about it. Hisato mentions Ikoma as one of the seven attackers, ranking over 10,000 points. I suppose maybe that's the point over which agents get ranked. I would quite like to see the ranking of the other classes, I, I suppose. Yeah, I think that's all my notes. Okay, shall we get into the Ashihara comments corner? Yeah, absolutely. Let's do that. So the for first names, I try to think of what parents name their kids. As Ashihara's breaking down how he comes up with names of characters. If this was any other mangaka, I'd doubt that they seriously think through each principal character's usually off-screen family when naming them, but for this series, I'd buy it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, I can imagine Ashihara making like a family tree for each and every one of the characters. It'd be like the Zelda encyclopedia, but with World Trigger. I was thinking the uh, Game of Thrones appendices with all of the different houses and clans. In the Q&A itself, there's a thing about improving one's trion. Um, it says you can improve your trion gland by actually consuming trion. I, I wonder what that means. Is there any trion intake that agents get at some point? Yeah, I guess 
Consuming Trion just literally means depleting it, like, when you're fighting. That seems like a very awkward way to put it, but... Uh... It's like consuming stamina in a video game. Oh, right. In this case, like, something else consumes you. Some... Mm, I think I get it. Okay. I thought it was literally refueling the Trion bodies. Yeah. I, I was like, what? I guess if you think of it like fuel for a car or something, like, the car is consuming fuel as you use it. It's, you know, it's, it's a tool that is using the fuel of Trion. Yeah, I like the detail that establishes that Escudo requires advanced prep in order to use. I guess that's one thing I've heard some people criticise is what are the clear drawbacks on, on using a Scudo? So I suppose if you just really focus on the wielder and don't give them ample time, they can't use it effectively because they have no time to set it up. I mean, the, it, it needs to steps to activate, but plus is setting it up in advance, like a trap, then activating mm. it, but couldn't you just do like the two steps one after the other? I feel like we see use, uses like that anyway, I don't know. Mm. I also like how this raises the question uh, even more regarding how useless Ragus is as a weapon. <laughs> this is like the blade slash shield that the boy with glasses has. And there's some info on the branches. I was wondering about them. It's, it turns out that it's only part-time agents. That, I suppose, explains why we just have Susanari 1. Then there's the definition of an all-rounder. Yeah, because this was something that we weren't really clear on in the border briefing file, so this gives a clearer cut version of what that means, really. It's hilarious how Arafune, he's a character who is defined by wanting to be an all-rounder and specializing in that, but he's not an all-rounder yet because he doesn't have any points in gunning. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose. I guess he's taking the long way for the maximum results. <laughs> One thing I didn't really think of, so we, we, we theorised in previous episodes about when the main squad are going to get Tamakoma triggers, like their own custom ones. Turns out Chica has already had one this whole time. It's just not particularly flashy, it's just like a neat way to holster lots of different kinds of guns. Reiji gave it her to train. That's one she had as a C-rank agent though. The question was about why she had it as a C-rank and Composer Beefcake just borrowed it to her so she could practice. Yeah, yeah the trigger comes with three sniper rifles and a bagworm, which I, I feel like she's still using that sort of setup so it might be the same one. <laughs> Maybe we'll find out in volume 19. Then we have the rooms of the squads if you want to move on to that, Hoven. Yeah, so so Ikoma's guitar makes me wonder what sort of music he plays. Any guesses from either of you? <laughs> we saw him playing, I think, in the opening of season three. Uh, I guess he just learned it to, to impress girls. Okay, so basically he tries to do like, hey there Delilah or something, but his voice is really weirdly deep for it. Because <laughs> the other routes I was thinking was he either has a novelty band, Flight of the Concords sort of vibe where he just sings really, really silly song, or he just does like a Johnny Cash impression where it's really like deep country singing. I just imagine he has a guitar and he tries to play the guitar with the nice song, and then he tries to sing and the song voice sounds funny. Maybe, yeah, his playing is on point, but he cannot sing. That is definitely big Ikoma energy, I could imagine that. I love how Mizukami makes Ikoma Squad the March Lion of World Trigger, while Oji makes everyone play chess. So we have a match between Shogi playing second in command and a chess playing captain. He has to just sit there and make heavy-handed metaphors about how tactics work while, while spinning chess pieces in, in his hands. <laughs> oh, okay, Oji, we get it. What if I were to order you to kill the Japanese? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wonder who, who he would order, um... <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who, who he would order in, in this manga to do that. <laughs> he is definitely just all of Code Geass combined. Like, like I told you from the very beginning, this is just the Code Geass squad. All he needs is a Pizza Hut sponsor sponsorship. Plus a random Rock Lee, but still, still Code Geass. It's very frustrating in OG's room. Why do they have two monitors on the opposite sides of the room. I'm really frustrated by this. It's not explained it <laughs> either. It's it's just such a waste of hardware. Like, get two HDMI cables and connect it up to Hire's desk at least. Or what are you doing with this? I mean, maybe they are to be used as separate devices. I don't know. <laughs> you don't know the ways of the prince. No, no, they are actually connected and he just wants to send it across to another monitor and then dramatically prance across the room and point at it. It's like, and this is what we need. I do love the image of OD prancing around. The so then there's the popularity poll. Yes. Um, damn the readership loves Konami. Yep. I did not expect that. I mean, she is a fun character. Hugh's ranking so low really surprises me. I figured he'd be top five. I do love... Hughes always gets the line of a petulant child, which he fucking is. I want to go home. Actually, now that I think about it, I kind of imagine him with the voice of... I, I don't know if you saw this, Alison, the trailer for one of the four new Pinocchio movies. 
What are you talking about? It's a trailer where they give Pinocchio a voice that sounds very much like a flamboyantly camp teen, <laughs> as opposed to a small boy. Father, when can I leave to be on my own? I've got the whole world to see. I'm gonna link it now. Th there, there it is. <laughs> what the heck is that? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> this is my first it, time seeing this. What the actual it's, it's hell quite is going something. on? It's quite something. I just feel like um, like Hughes would be the obvious. Jin, when can I leave and go home? I have seen enough of the world. <laughs> I imagine him saying that to Visa back in his younger days. Okay. Uh, Arsim is the missionary of barbecue. What the fuck does that even mean? What do you mean also Miwa loves barbecue? Is that a ship now? Are you giving us clues, Ashihara? I mean, we've got Arafune, protector of butts. Yes. <laughs> uh, Osama's popularity is, is still kind of wild. Also, Jin's impressive to be still placing this high since he does nothing. I love how the poll basically stops with Kitora, even though her ranking is still below 30. Ashihara being desperate in, in featuring basically one of the main supporting characters, who surprisingly ranks always very low. Tachikawa and Ninamiya being lower than the likes of Arafune and Izumi is very weird to me. I feel like it's surprising that they're not higher. Meanwhile, while it's kind of a shame, I think characters like Kagayura and Kikuchihara not being that high doesn't surprise me as much. They're very distinctive characters, but they don't quite have the poochie factor, at least to the extent that other characters do. I think in World Trigger's case, I, I think they still rank pretty high, because the, there's just a whole lot of characters in World Trigger and they, they are given similar importance, so... Izumi's popularity is still really weird. <laughs> I agree. He does like nothing. <laughs> okay, shall we nip into the spoiler corner? Let's do it. Okay, so Alison, what are some of your favourite moments from the series following this point, and uh, what are your thoughts on the current chapters? Yeah, if you got any. I think one of the more recent moments that was my favourite was when the little small boy who rides the doggo horse was like some sort of alien prince. Yes, that was a big twist. <laughs> I just thought that was just like so weird, but also would make sense somehow. Also building up that the capybara can transform into a giant monster. Exactly, that's also fairly important. I still don't know if it was a joke on Jin's part or not. Mm. <laughs> I guess we'll find out. <laughs> Overall chapters... It's like there's a lot going on, but there's a lot to remember at the same time. Yeah, I can definitely see someone finding the current arc especially overwhelming in terms of stuff to digest. There is a lot there. Uh, if you're into it, there's a lot to like. If you're reading mostly casually, it's... yeah, it's hard to remember. Yeah, it's like we're getting Hunter Hunter level of info dump chapters. So reading it all at once is just like, oh gosh, this is a lot. I can definitely see the, the parallel between this and the Dark Continent arc in Hunter Hunter is quite strong for me. Is that about the extent of your thoughts on kind of post this volume roll trigger? Yep. What are your thoughts? Ah, see, see, I'm being coy and saving it for when we catch up. I don't mind discussing them. I generally think that this is kind of an arc that may make us care a bit more about the characters that, that we didn't care about before. If this series is building up to a very large invasion force on the away mission, we're going to have to care about these characters because we can make some of them die and we want those moments to hit. So I suppose I think this is kind of necessary a bit to stop and maybe have a bit of a moment to examine Border as an organization. At first, some of the dynamics between Suwa and Katori were testing my patience a bit, but, but I, I feel like this character progression is heading into the right direction. The Wakamura stuff, like the the other glasses boy with the blonde hair, who was Katori's uh, subordinate. I have no idea what the stuff with him is going for in the long run, or where his characterization is going to go. But I guess it's good that it keeps me guessing in that regard. That's a good answer. <laughs> Well, thank you, Professor. I also have a bit of a spoilery note about this volume, uh, that we did uh, mention Mizukami disguising Asteroid as Hound, and maybe that inspired Osama to come up with his plan for Ninamiya. I don't know if actually he interacts with Mizukami uh, that much. Also not really the biggest spoiler, but we learned that Kusakabe Squad are very focused on using their mobility to target weak points, a lot like Oji Squad, uh, which definitely matches up with uh, Midori Kawa, so I'll be interested to see how 
the other combatants in the squad that fit in with that. So with Kazuma and as as Kendra put it, the, the one with the big mouth, it definitely fits him as well. Okay, let's move to the Q&A section. Woohoo, Q&A! So we got, at the end of our last Border Beating File episode, I asked what would people pitch as a World Trigger tie-in movie, and Randall Jr., our regular commenter, has given us one. World Trigger movie idea. So it would start with an announcement from Kido that there would be a Border Appreciation Day, so all agents would be at the base for the day. We see some interactions between Tamakoma 1 and people they don't usually see. All of the squad operators would be hanging out in a room having a little party. And then for the main event, there would be a free-for-all battle royale. They would debut a huge map with different areas and zones, and we'd see things like Jin and Tachikawa fighting, Mizurikawa and Yuma sparring, Konami versus Ko, etc. Osamu loses instantly and ends up exploring the base. <laughs> uh, he finds an archive room where he sees files on border. One of these is an immersive 3D VR video experience, where he gets to see firsthand the very first invasion and sees Kido get his scar on the battlefield. Uh, the video playback ends and Osamu sees Kido standing in the room with him. They chat a bit before cutting back to seeing the end result of the battle royale. Uh, we get a short montage of more festivities as the movie ends. Yeah, I think it's a really uh, cute pitch. I suppose I would imagine that Netsuki as the PR bloke would egg Kido on to do this to raise more funds and then Kinata would be extremely opposed because he would be earned. You do know that we have limited resources, right? Do we really want to waste stuff on this? Yes. Yes, we do. Using a movie for how would these characters match up with each other is always right ground for that. I like the idea of it being fairly low stakes. I guess the one thing is, is the Osamu finding out more about Kido thing is like, is this something that we're going to get in the series proper? Like, we're actually going to get the flashback of that? But because we have no way of knowing that, it's it's a pretty cute idea. Yeah, watching Demon Slayer in general made me kind of wanting to have anime movies being used as a way to hype up certain arcs from manga. And Randall also asked us if if, if we could pitch a movie idea of a world trigger. I think I'd be interested in seeing the Jin and Arashiyama squad battling the, the Miwa, Tachikawa and Kazama squads as they want to capture Yuma and the Black Trigger. I feel like this is like short enough and then also battle heavy enough so we could get a few good moments and also have a very action heavy arc be better animated. So yeah, I feel like this could be a pretty fun spectacle. And my movie is the joke one where Shiori actually makes the Rad Rangers a legitimate superhero tokusatsu squad and, and saves the day. <laughs> uh, my only movie idea is a crossover promotional movie with something else in the Square magazine. I don't know which one would be the closest, but like maybe either Blue Exorcist or Seraph of the End could work, maybe? I'd like to see it cross over with Astrolos in space, maybe. Ooh, yeah. Seeing Yuma duck facing with angsty anime vampire boys <laughs> would be quite amusing. <laughs> I, I do like that image. I mean, if it was still in Trump, I would have had more ideas, but since it's in Square and a lot of stuff that's in Square isn't in, in English, I just had to pick the two closest yeah. ones that get English publications. I think that's everything for the question corner. Uh, shall we move it to the round off? Yeah, let's do it. All right, that is going to do it for the 18th episode of Duckface Diaries. You can listen to us on so many podcast hosting sites. Anchor, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Breaker, Overcast, Radio Public, Pocket Cast, Podbay, Play FM, Listen Notes, Castro, Google Podcasts. But maybe I'll figure out Stitcher, maybe not. We'll see. Patreon.com slash Cheddar is where all the links are. Everything is in the pinned post. That's also what helps me pay the bills. So if you want me to devote more time to making the show better, consider supporting me there. In return, you can get your name in the YouTube credits uh, or a World Trigger Duckface avatar. Uh, plus, you can help me reach more ambitious goals like reviving World Trigger Abridged. Remember that much like the neighborhood, the YouTube algorithm is a dark abyss of sorrows and woes from which channels like these never resurface. And what helps us navigate it is liking, subscribing, and sharing the podcast with a friend. On the YouTube channel and the same RSS feed, you get access to not only Duckface Diaries, but Manga Mosaic, a collection of podcasts and video essays on other manga titles, short along the line. On the same 
channel. You can find the introductory episode of Podcast Mon Adventures, our new retrospective where we cover the Pokemon special manga arc by arc, along with the host of the Pinker Ale pod, Henry Kathman. Uh, the introductory episode is out. I'm not sure when we're going to record the red, green, and blue arc pod because the omnibus volumes I ordered, it's taking them a bit of time to arrive, so I don't know what's going on with them. But yeah, follow us there. And uh, Alison, where can people find you? You can find me at Meowth900 on twitter.com. You can also find me sometimes on Demon Slayer Podcast with that V-Lord guy and Laser Kid. You can also find me on Five Dumb Weebs. It's where we talk about anime and manga and other weeby stuff. Yeah, I liked your episode on the ReZero The Frozen Bond quite a bit. Oh uh, yeah, and uh, I checked out your episode on A Whisker Away. It's a super fun discussion about a very comfy as well as sad movie to watch. So yeah, a uh, really fun one. A Whisker Away is so good. Mm, yeah. I did have Vlod on the channel, but it, it was back in the Teenage Renaissance David episode of Manga Mosaic. Uh, God, this was so long ago. Great contribution, though. Hoven, plug our sister show. Did you enjoy the talk of kicking picture frames? Well, boy, do I have a discussion for you about a series that makes you want to kick picture frames with the We Never Learns Branching Endings Let It Down episode of Hoven's Hideaway, where we really go into our disappointment with how the harem romance manga we never learn ended why we don't think it was a fitting ending for the series so yeah give that a look it was a really fun one to record once again you can find all the links to that in the description or in the pin post at patreon.com slash send us emails questions comments suggestions at wednesdale 12 at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter at Duckface Diaries or individual Twitters at Wesley Tender, at Hoven with an H. Follow Alison at Meowth900 and the Dumb Sweet Podcast at Dumb Sweet Pod. A sincere thank you to Milo Jack Stillitz, who composed our ending theme and orchestral rendition of Giri Giri, the first opening sequence for World Trigger. You can find his work at southcloud.com slash Milo hyphen Jack hyphen Stillitz. What are we covering next time? Next time, we're looking at volume 19, which covers chapters 161 to 169, and is adapted across episodes 1 to 4 of season 3 of the anime. We're not sure if we'll actually do that next, or if we do another order breaking farm, but whatever we do, we'll see you next time. Alison, thank you very much for guesting. And I, uh, I loved every second of uh, of every picture frame you mentioned. <laughs> yep, but I make it chaotic. It's my brand. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right then, so this was the 18th episode of Duckface Diaries, and as always, it's time to bugger off. off. Father, when can I leave to be on my own? <laughs>